Hello biologists, we're going to do lab 3.10 today together. We're going to talk about diffusion across cell membranes. Cell transport is the idea that stuff goes in and out of cells across a cell membrane. The cell membrane is like the security system for the cell. These blue guys here in airport security are a lot like the blue guys in the cell. Anything big has to go through protein channels, but small stuff like air can go right through airport security. And that's kind of like what a cell is like. The, the airport security for a cell is the cell membrane. The phospholipid bilayer it makes up the majority of the cell membrane. It's all those phospholipids we learned about. This is a phospholipid and there's two layers of them, hence the bilayer. The small molecules like O2 and CO2 can squeeze between the phospholipids and diffuse through the cell membrane. Cell membranes are selectively permeable, just kind of like a colander that whatever you use to drain your noodles, the water can go through, but the noodles stay on the other side of the colander or sieve in your kitchen. Diffusion is the movement of small molecules in a space. Molecules are always moving and they move from high concentration to low concentration. Let's look at a demo here. A quart jar of water and I'm going to add a little bit of food coloring here, just a couple drops. And you see that the food coloring doesn't spread out right away. It stays concentrated. It's all together. The food coloring molecules make a glob at first, but now they're diffusing. I'm not shaking or stirring the water, but because the water molecules and the food coloring molecules are always moving, they're going to mix together. And over time, that dye is going to diffuse across all the water and make it uniformly blue. I'll back up here a little bit so you can see the whole jar. You can see that right now the food coloring is in a column right here. But after a while, through the movement of the molecules, water molecules are always moving, and the food, the food coloring molecules are always moving, they'll blend together and this jar will be uniformly blue. Those food coloring molecules are going to move from the high concentration, that blob of food coloring, to the lower concentration out into the rest of the water. Here's what that looks like. Here's a model. There's the blob of food coloring and that's what it's going to look like when it's at equilibrium. Those food coloring mo molecules are moving from high concentration to low concentration. If you have a hard time remembering, remember a slippery slide. It's easy, it doesn't take any energy to go down a slide, to go from high to low concentration. So diffusion is passive transport. It doesn't take any energy to go from high to low. Diffusion can happen across cell mem membranes, and we're gonna use some model cells to model how diffusion happens across a cell membrane into a cell. Here's another example of how molecules go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Over time, it's going to look like this. This represents a cell membrane in the middle of this beaker here. Over time, cells are going to reach, or diffusion is going to reach an equilibrium, which means molecules of a substance are evenly spread out in space. Here's what one side of the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell look like at the beginning and as time passes the inside and the outside become equal because diffusion these molecules move from high concentration to low concentration and after a while everything becomes equal. It reaches equilibrium. Passive transport is the movement of materials through a cell membrane without using energy. Diffusion is one form of passive transport. 
the size of a cell determines how long it takes material to diffuse all the way to the middle. For this lab, we're going to use two different size model cells. We're going to use a very large cell that's 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, and we're going to use a very small set model cell that's 1 by 1 by 1 centimeters. The size of the cell does not control the rate of diffusion. Diffusion is always going to have the same speed for this lab because we use the same kind of auger for all of our model cells. So we can consider it's like the speed limit of a car. Our car can only go 60 miles per hour. It doesn't matter which cube we're using, whether we're using the big one or the little one, diffusion is going to go at the same speed. It's kind of like whether you're going to drive across Texas or Rhode Island. You're going to go the same speed in both states, but it's going to take you a lot longer to cross Texas than it is going to cross Rhode Island. The very first question on your lab sheet asks you about how will the surface area to volume ratio of the cube affect the rate of diffusion. Well, diffusion's always going to have the same rate because, like we talked about, a car is always going to drive at the same speed. But let's figure out what surface area and volume are so we can figure out the ratio and figure out why else that might be important. The data table in question one looks like this. It asks for surface area of cube A and volume of cube A. For this lab, this is cube A. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. Surface area is a lot like wrapping a present. It's the outside of something. It's the area on the outside of the box. How much flat surface is on the outside of this box? And don't panic, we're going to do the math together. The surface area of a cube here is the surface area of each one of its sides. And if you look carefully at this diagram here, you can figure out how many sides we have to calculate. Fortunately, in a cube, they're all the same. Area has two dimensions. It's length times width. So the area of one side of the large cube, cube A here, is 10 times 10. That equals 100. How many sides are on a cube? Well, how many sides are on a dice? The answer is right in front of you. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So for a cube, we need to multiply the area of one side times 6 to get surface area. So for cube A, that's going to be 600 centimeters squared because each side is 100 centimeters squared. 10 times 10 equals 100, and 100 times 6 equals 600 centimeters squared. So for cube A on your data sheet, put 600 square centimeters. Here it is all filled out. Six sides, that's length times width is 100 times 6 is 600 centimeters squared. We're going to do the surface area for cube B before we go on to volume so we can compare them. For the smaller cube, cube B, the calculations are the same, but where it's, remember cube B is much smaller. It's only one centimeter on each side. So for each side of cube B, we have one centimeter times one centimeter. And there are six sides, so that's six centimeters cubed, or six centimeters squared, excuse me. For cube B on your data sheet, one times one times six equals six centimeters squared. So this is data table B, 6 centimeters squared. So we filled out the first part of two different data tables, A and B. 
Now let's talk about volume of cubes. Volume is to measure how much is inside something, how much fits inside the box, or the water bottle, or the cooler, or everyday objects that you might use to carry something. How do we calculate volume? Well, we need three dimensions for volume. Remember, surface area were two, now we need three. We're talking about the stuff inside. So we need three dimensions here. For the big one, it's going to be 10 times 10 times 10, which is 1,000 cubic centimeters. So for the big cube, it's 1,000 cubic centimeters. That's cube A. Here's your data table. For cube A, the volume is 1,000 cubic centimeters. There's a typo here. It should be 1,000 cubic centimeters. How do we calculate volume for the small cube? One centimeter cubed. It's one centimeter times one centimeter times one centimeter, there is only one centimeter cubed here. So your data table for cube B is going to look like this. The volume for cube B is one centimeter cubed. Perspective on um, the difference between our big cube and our little cube, this is a thousand cubic centimeters. It's a lot. This is one cubic centimeter. It's not very much. So the difference between our small cube and our large cube is a lot. There's a thousand times difference. There's a really big difference too in the surface area. This is 600 cubic or square centimeters. This is the surface area of our big cell. This is six square centimeters. It's the surface area of our little cell. So for comparison, you can see there's a huge difference in surface area. The next thing we're gonna do is compute the ratio of the volume, that's how many of these fit in our little cell, the surface area divided by the volume. For the big cell, it's going to be 600 divided by 1,000. For the little cell, it's going to be 6 divided by 1. So just to review, surface area and volume, that ratio is going to be the surface area in centimeters squared divided by the volume, how much stuff fits in there. It's the outside divided by the inside. We calculate it by taking the surface area and just dividing by the volume. It's pretty easy, don't panic. It's just that number we calculated for surface area in centimeters squared divided by volume in centimeters cubed. For cube A, it's 600 centimeters squared, that big sheet of wrapping paper, all six sides added up together, divided by the thousand cubic centimeters here. When you divide that, when you divide 600 by a thousand, you get 0.6. So for your data table A, the surface area to volume ratio for cube A, that's the yellow table, is 0.6. For cube B, that little cube with the green writing on it, we take six centimeters squared and we divide by one cubic centimeter. So six divided by one equals six. So for cube B, our little cube here, this is our little cube of agar, the surface area to volume is 6. Here's the